perspective. And then we have Julie Van de Vaal, uh, who's from UBC C350, and she's going to approach the question from um, more of a diagnostic point of view. So all the panelists will speak for a couple minutes, 30, 40 minutes, and then we'll hopefully open the floor to discussion and have some really interesting chit chat. So without further ado. Cool, thank you. Um, as you said, my name is Wilson Wong, this is Emily Morgan. We are both from a club called UC Active Surrounders. Uh, just really, really quick, um, our club is a student club here on campus. Um, and our mantra, our motto really in a nutshell, is to challenge the way people perceive animals um, and to challenge the ways we currently exploit animals in, our, in the way our society is currently built. Um, so as you can tell from the description I just gave you, uh, we tend to deal with mostly the ethical issues with our use of animals, um, but obviously there are a lot of health and environmental issues, issues associated with our use of animals and our exploitation of animals with that too. And, um, Hence this talk, uh, we'll be mostly talk, I'll be mostly talking about the environmental issues with our use of animals, uh, but then I'll be able to expand more on your topics. Um, so you might be questioning, you know, okay, what's, what's, what's the main goal of my talk? Well, my personal portion is I really want to emphasize a very, very strong link between the livestock industry and the animals we raise for food and the massive environmental impact that that has. Um, and this is something people don't really talk about that much. So you might be asking yourself, you know, hang on, food animals and environments? Is there really large impacts? I mean, I've heard about cars, trains, and buses, and planes, and that's obviously horrible for the environments. Um, but in fact, food animals, uh, the animals we raise for food, does have a huge impact too. And um, this, was, this was most profoundly stated in uh, 2006 by the UN FAO, which is the Food and Agriculture Organization. They released this groundbreaking report called uh, Livestock's Long Shadow. Um, it's a 400 page plus report. Um, and one of the key findings, or really, the most, most resonant um, statistic that came out of this was that 18% um, of all greenhouse gas emissions was actually directly attributed to uh, the livestock industry, the food and the animals we raise for meat. Um, and this might not seem like a lot. Um, but it was actually larger than all the transportation industry combined. So that's more than all the cars, planes, trains, buses, lorries, ferries, anything with an internal combustion engine, really. Um, so there's a lot of media focus on you know, trying to get people to use public transport, ride their bikes, so on and so forth, and to cut down our use of internal combustion engines. But the fact of the matter is, there's not that much attention um, and focusing on our, our current diets. And, you know, not everyone drives or uses a bus or flies. Uh, but everyone eats three times a day. I hope so, at least. Um, so I do want to point out that this figure was revised quite recently, well, last year, to 14.5%. Um, so it is quite a bit smaller, but it's still not an insignificant amount. It's something we should definitely consider. Um, and so there are so these effects are not just limited to greenhouse gas effects, um, and there there's a wealth of information out there. So for example, four-fifths of the Amazonian deforestation uh, is directly linked to cattle ranching. These are increasing demand for cheap beef. Um, it uses, the livestock industry uses one-third of the world's fresh water supply. That's massive. And in the U.S. alone, livestock feed alone requires 167 million pounds of pesticides, 17 billion pounds of nitrogen fertilizer, 149 million acres of crop. And I could go on and on and on, but you are all UC students, you are well equipped with finding these statistics online yourself, and you will find very, very much the same thing. I just kind of pulled at random, really. Um, and, and the main point I want to say is that there is a very, very direct and very, very real and strong link between the livestock industry and the environmental impacts. And the other thing that people don't really tend to consider that much is there is also a huge social cost uh, in our livestock industry. Um, consider this, oh, sorry. Consider this, 8,500 children die every day from hunger, this was pulled from Oxfam. Um, now, 8,500 children, you know, that's, you know, I'm, I'm an engineer, I deal with numbers quite a bit, but every once in a while I try to, like, relate it to things I can understand. And 8,500, what does that mean? That's actually more than the student population of solder, forestry, and engineering combined. Um, could you imagine if that sort of calamity were to happen, uh, you know, just 
one day, uh, that will make front page news ever. But because this is a systemic problem, they're merely a statistic. It's not news, and I find that extremely sad. And that number, 8,500, I really want to highlight that. You know, how does this make sense when we feed, when we devote two thirds of our total agricultural land is used to grow feed crops, not for people, but for livestock, so that we can have cheap hamburgers, steaks, chicken fillets, so on and so forth. Am I the only one in this room who's sort of uncomfortable with these facts? And David Pimentel from Cornell University, he summarizes this, this, this sort of um, um, this message quite well, actually, that if all the grain we currently fed to livestock were instead consumed directly by people, instead of you know, fed to our future hamburgers and steaks and chicken fillets and so on and so forth, we could feed nearly 800 million people. And, um, you know, there's this man here, he's, uh, his name is Philip Wong. He's the ex-vice president of Citibank, and I know a lot of people here are not huge fans, are not huge fans of banks, but um, he summarized my sentiments quite well, actually, and he uses pretty emotive language. He said, believe me, every morsel of meat we eat is slapping the tear-stained face of a hungry child. And I know this is very emotive, and this might be pretty exaggerated, um, but I, I do think there is quite a lot of truth in that. Um, so now I do want to talk about UBC and sustainability, uh, which is the main point of this talk, after all. Um, I do want to acknowledge that UBC does some amazing work in, in terms of sustainable technology and sustainable policies and so on and so forth. Um, and on campus, they are very eager to advocate to us students for you know, things like you know, using bicycles and, and public transit. You know, great. I definitely don't want to fight against that. Um, this was a picture I pulled off during the Ripple Effect uh, campaign. Um, they're, out, they're great at advocating for nest napkins and taking short showers, that sort of thing. But there's never any mention of the, the use of our of the use of animals and the environments. And that was something that was always bothering me. And the reason why it bothered me was that if you look at the grand scale of things, the amount of impact animals have on the environments far trumps all the other things. So for example, just, just taking the last example there, taking shorter showers. You guys have already know I'm an engineer, I love doing math, so I did some math this, this, uh, this past weekend, and I calculated, you know, okay, how much could I save, how much water could I save if I were to cut my shower time in half? So what I did was that I assume, uh, and this is an upper limit estimate, by the way, you could save up to 71 liters um, if you were to cut your shower time in half. And the reason I say it's an, uh, it's an upper limit estimate is that I assume a maximum flow rate of 2.5 gallons per minute, and which is actually the maximum allowed flow rate in North America. And you could save several meters, and that's a lot of water. I won't deny that. But let's say you were to take your shower, uh, your shower time cut in half, and you went out to sit down to a, to a, a meal, a dinner, and you were to have a burger. What is the environmental cost of a burger? In terms of water, no, there's a lot more cost, obviously. And I calculated that, and it turns out that an average burger would uh, result in a water cost of 1,893 liters. So really, it's, it's, it's ridiculously naive and myopic if you were to do all these sort of like, really unradical and un really conservative uh, methods of you know, taking less snappings, taking shorter showers, and then you went on to still consume meat. It's sort of, I tried to think of an analogy to really capture this sort of thing. And the best I could come up with was deciding one day that um, you were really, really adamant in saving money and you decided that from now on, the only thing I'm going to eat is crappy cup noodles for a dollar each. But then still refusing to give up um, transiting to school every day by taxi. You know, you're sort of missing the big elephant in the room here, which is animals. So, uh, the next thing, oh, sorry, I forgot about this. Uh, so, the UN Food and Agricultural Organization, um, they summarize the points I want to make quite well. That, you know, raising animals for food is ridiculously inefficient. It is one of the top two or three most significant contributors to the most serious environmental problems at every scale from local to global. And this is the main point I want to drive home to everyone here. Um, I feel like a lot of people already had an inkling of this sort of, uh, this sort of connection between the two. Um, now, I want to talk about UBC and CIRS, uh, CIRS, which is the Center for Interactive Research and Sustainability. This is an actual building that exists on West Mall. It's actually a really interesting building. It's a beautiful building. Um, and it's, it's, it's commonly quoted as UBC's, uh, well, North America's greenest campus building. Um, 
but there, every time I walked by, there was always something that bothered me a lot about it. And you can probably guess, uh, in this cafe, it always it still serves meat and uh, flesh and animal products. And that bothered me. Um, and I asked myself, you know, how can a building which has attempted every obscure and incremental technology in an effort to, to inch sort of to inch towards sustainable sustainability in you know, one of the most obvious ways to reduce uh, one's eco footprint, which is you know um, not consuming animal products and not using animals. Um, so I did some investigation, um, or in other terms, I pissed off a lot of people. Uh, and I, I emailed a lot of people, I asked a lot of questions. In the beginning, I didn't, I didn't actually get that any answer. A lot of people just ignored me because my questions were, I won't lie, pretty inconvenient. Um, and after a while, I did manage to get some replies. And some of them said things like, some of them you know, said really meaningful things and talked about the, the many, many ways they were trying to cut down on waste. For example, they were only trying to serve food that did not have packaging. Things that I also found out. But there were some points that, that was just absolutely ridiculous. And I'll let you see this for yourself. Um, this was one of my favorite points. Uh, this was no cooking up was done on site. Uh, so this way, we lowered energy and water consumption, as well as we met the goals of zero carbon emissions at CIRS. So I looked at her in the face and I said, hang on, so you don't cook anything on site, but you still serve cooked food. She's like, yes. So does, does that mean you just cook next door and you truck it over? And she's like, yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, do you not see the problem here? You know, Mother Nature does not care whether you cook it in Totem Park or in Sears or Place Bane or, I don't know, China for that matter. Um, Mother Nature cares that there are there is environmental costs to that. And not to mention, the cooking, if you look at the actual life, life cycle analysis, the cooking, uh, the energy required to go into cooking is actually pretty insignificant overall, uh, over the entire life cycle of that food product. Um, especially if that food product con contains uh, meat and animal flesh. Um, this one's even better, actually. Um, there was a desire to limit the amount of water use, which is great, obviously. Um, so this way, we, we decided not to provide reusable China service, so not no ceramic plates. And instead, they decided to opt for a disposable plates, you know, compostable and recyclable dishware. And again, this is the same sort of thinking um, as the one before. They, this is really a, a better uh, way to step towards sustainability. I don't think so. Um, so like the amount of energy it takes, and the amount of energy and resources it takes to produce a one-time use plate far outweighs the amount of energy and time and resources it takes to simply wash a ceramic plate. Um, so you can see the way they're achieving all these sustainable goals is to simply outsource the resource and, and, um, and water usage somewhere else. Um, so they're really not really stepping towards sustainability, they're, they're simply reframing the problem so that it looks good on paper. Um, but really, it's not meaningful at all. And you know, as someone who had a lot of faith in UBC, I'm an international student, and I traveled um, I know, 21 hours away from flight to come to UBC, uh, mainly because of its great reputation and because of Carol's sustainability and so forth, and so on and so forth. When I dug, up, uh, dug down into the details of what this really meant, it was, I don't, I don't know, it was kind of sad and depressing, and I'm kind of sad that I'm no longer ignorant, but, <laughs> um, but anyways, that's all I have to say. I'm going to pass it on.